Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and today we're talking goblins. Now the goblins are an interesting bunch but before I start I want to bring up some imagery that was sent through to the channel of you, uh, created by you as artists um, of various goblin interpretations. These sketches I think are more about the idea behind goblins than uh, anything else but I did particularly like this one. I thought it was quite, quite amusing. Anyway, goblins and the idea of goblins. Oh, this one behind me is actually a goblin um, wizard of some kind. He features uh, in the uh, book that we're busy writing at the moment uh, on a complete guide to, to designing your campaign, uh, which will hopefully be out by, um, well, I'll be hoping by November or so. So watch out for that. But the idea behind goblins is that traditionally we look at goblins as being this incompetent rat pack of little shriveled green hook-nosed big-eared monsters and uh, that's how we see them and when you read the description in the monsters manuals and the books that talk about goblins generally speaking that's what they're portrayed as twitchy little angry antsy incompetent goblinoids that are at the lowest rung of their species and they they part of the the whole uh, group of bugbears and hobgoblins and that kind of thing the goblin is the lowest lowest tier in that food chain and is frequently part of the food chain their leadership structure is the smartest or the strongest goblin dominates for a while until they get taken out by someone who then replaces them. So it's a very informal kind of leadership. It's very, very loosely defined. Fairly recently, thanks to the things like World of Warcraft and uh, that kind of take on goblins, we've started to look at goblins as being a little bit more perhaps intelligent sneakier more manipulative harry potter's goblins having them run the banking system so there's some interesting takes on our traditional goblin and it's entirely up to you as to how you're going to form goblins in your world are you going to base them on the rat pack where they run around in loincloths and eat each other and, and that kind of thing or are you going to push them further and make them more intelligentsia gnomish like creatures just with big green ears and things and one could argue that Yoda was really just a very wise old goblin and uh, well who knows anyway so the idea of little green men with pointed ears and big hooked noses is where we start in terms of goblins and of course it's about challenging that expectation and about building goblins in such a way that they are interesting so this little guy here he stole the cloak of a wizard and that helps improve his intelligence so he's risen in the ranks he's now commanding a goblin army which initially he used his little forays to break out and attack villages and things in different areas to keep the local town guard confused hoping to lure the lord and his army out of his castle which of course happened and then he led a counter army into the castle, took the castle, and now holds the castle. The Lord is entrenched outside in a siege. But the Lord is not succeeding in this siege because the goblins keep sending out little parties of people who are very well trained in skirmishing tactics, hit and run, which is what goblins are traditionally used for. And so they're hitting these siege lines and they're causing the siegers to feel as if they are under siege and questioning whether their Lord really should try and retake this castle or not. So it's an interesting turnaround on the old story that uh, the siege is not necessarily the best way of taking this castle from the goblins. So that's an idea of playing around with what happens when goblins become intelligent. What happens if they move beyond their ranks. Now, importantly to look at, as we have looked at the lair of a beholder, which is vertical shafts moving up and down, when we look at goblins, goblins are quite, quite small. And I feel that this is something that perhaps we don't take into account as Game Masters because we don't want to exclude our bigger, heavily armor-clad player characters. But goblins are small. If they are digging tunnels, if they are going deeper into the cliff face or into the dungeon wall side, 
They're not like dwarves who like to build majestic large temples that allow them to walk in their heavy armor and have still miles of headspace above them for whatever reason. Well, the reason is so that their bigger companions can move through. Goblins don't have that. They don't like hobgoblins or bugbears. They, they dominate goblins. So goblins want to have little secret hideaways where only someone who happens to be three and a half foot or a meter tall can actually fit with any comfort. Spears are used for stabbing only. Throwing them is not going to happen in these warren-like spaces. So if a knight wanted to go into a goblin territory, he would have a lot of problems trying to get down those passageways. So don't be afraid to have the goblins infesting some kind of dungeon or area. You've got your big warrior walking down there, and then there's a little half, maybe two, maybe one foot tall passageway that the goblins sneak down and disappear in and he can't follow the sorceress with all of her spell books she can't follow her spell book is a foot tall for heaven's sakes it can't fit down the passageway so here you have a chance to have this incredibly bizarre almost uh, lord of the flies type situation where you've got these very small little creatures that are pecking and picking off the adventurers. Now, we also often think of goblins as being the early level encounters. Oh, you, you've got some early players. They're not very, they haven't ranked up. They haven't got a lot of experience points. Oh, we'll give them goblins because goblins fight in little clusters and they're fairly easy to kill because they don't have a lot of health value points. They don't have a lot of hit points. They don't have a lot of armor class and their spears don't do very much damage because they're not very strong. Yes. That is if you just want them as fodder. You can push them so much further, though, by having this lair where they use those numbers, where if you look at goblin tactics and they're fighting something bigger, they're not going to form a neat circle around that individual and wait for that individual to attack them one at a time. They're going to work out ways where they can hurl themselves at the enemy. So maybe it's a team of three goblins. Two goblins form a saddle hand. The third goblin stands on the hand and they throw him or her at the enemy. If you're being attacked by nine goblins, that means three of them are launching at you at the same time from different directions. Yes, there is, of course, the comedic aspect of the player ducking or the character ducking out of the way and the three goblins colliding with one another or overshooting and all those kinds of things. Absolutely correct, except that the goblins are particularly agile. So the chances of them missing should be limited. It's not that difficult to land on someone. Sure, it might be that they don't overpower that person and drag them to the ground. They don't need to. If the person is wearing heavy armor and the goblin has a little fishing hook that's got a piece of rope attached to it back to those other two goblins, you now have six goblins with ropes hooked into the leather armor or the plate armor of the central character. And they're going to tug. Six of them pulling in one direction, three of them riding on top of you. It's not necessarily going to pull the character over. A strong character can resist that. I'd also like to see a strong character then try and do something about it. They've got this dead weight that's pulling on them. They've got these three little goblins that are sitting on top of them, hacking at them with knives. Again, your system might not be adequate enough to deal with that kind of situation. What I tend to do is to then turn the goblins from being a monster encounter where individually they are not successful simply because the dice determine that they're not successful, but individually they don't work. But they're not about individual, are they? The whole idea of goblins is that they reproduce and they multiply and they expand and they do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So I treat them more as an effect, like an ooze-like effect that washes over players. So this mass of goblins pile up on top of the individuals. It's not a single goblin that attacks, it's multiple goblins that attack. And that, to me, makes them a much more interesting encounter, a much more threatening encounter. 
at exactly the same time, I will then, if the party manages to capture a goblin, take that goblin and make them the most terrified, skittish, paranoid little creature that one possibly can do in order to then convey that individually they pose no threat, collectively they're dangerous. So it's a very different type of creature that you now have created. Early level characters, early party members who don't have a lot of pips or dice in their skills and things, have them come across six or seven goblins that can't act as a collective. But once they get to starting to face up as they start to power up 20 or 30 goblins, there should be a real danger that this tribe of 30 are going to prevail because they're acting as a homogenous whole. I must apologize for the banging in the background. My neighbors have decided today is the day that they refurbish, apparently, their entire apartment uh, using very small hammers and not being very strong to drive those nails into the ground, which is what the goblins would be like if you were to think about it. Anyway, so... The opportunity to use goblins in a different way, perhaps, or perhaps this is how you've been using them, but the idea that there is this space. Now, the goblins also keep wolves and rats. This is something that the books talk about. Wolf riding goblins is, yes, to a degree, terrifying. I don't think, though, that the goblins would use them as a cavalry. The cavalry is about power. You ride this heavy war horse with a heavy lance or a heavy spear and you impale your opponent and drive over them. A wolf, they are indeed heavy and big, but they're not bulldozers. They're too agile for that sort of thing. I would imagine the goblins would again use the wolves as a platform to surf ride, if you like. As the wolf is busy loping along, as the wolf is busy running, these goblins are on the wolf's back two, maybe three of them, and as the wolf leaps up, the goblins leap off of the back of the wolf. So you get slammed onto by this wolf that's trying to attack you, and then you get the goblins pouring all over you to try and then overpower you, drag you down, do whatever it is that they're going to do. But again, the goblin mentality is one of many of us versus one of you, and we will try it. So they've got to have tactics. You've got to give them tactics that make and take advantage <coughs> of that, excuse me. So that is what your goal should be with goblins, is creating this horde, this wave, this coverage of little green things. And yes, there's the comical aspect that goblins naturally bring with them. And at every convention, invariably, someone is running a module where the players get to play goblins and they blow themselves up and they do all sorts of crazy and wonderful things. That's absolutely fine. And if you want to have goblins as a comedic relief, go for it. They need to have some means of supporting themselves in this way. Do they become a circus act? Do they tour around as, as beggars and they're these pathetically sad little creatures that live on the fringes of cities? That's the flavoring that you need to come up with. So I generally will make goblins amusing, but I will give them this dark back shadow that follows them around so my players know to respect them they are dangerous in numbers and i think that's what makes them so so different from all of the other monsters that we've looked at that are huge and powerful and dramatic i think goblins in numbers are far more terrifying than a single vampire a vampire six players can surround and just beat down on that poor old vampire maybe he's got some thralls to keep him company but goblins the goblins will surround you not the other way around, unless you've gone in with an army. In which case, the goblins probably won't encounter you. They'll disappear into their holes, and they won't be seen, and they won't they'll be heard, but you can't get them out of their little tunnels and things. And I find that particularly interesting. They build traps, of course, as well. Not very good ones, perhaps, not very cunning ones, but they build them. So it's hindrance factors. Now, in the... Um, Adventurer's Box, the um, Mines of Fendelvir, the uh, um, introduction to D&D 5th edition, goblins feature quite heavily in the opening adventure. I'm not going to tell you the outcome of that, but let's just say that I think the goblins there are played fairly well. I do think that the goblins don't necessarily pose too much of a threat, but it's an opening adventure for low-level characters. It's what it's all about. Having run that for different parties of very experienced players, I can tell you those goblins, if they get the right roles, can decimate the party, especially if you start to apply the thinking that goblins are 
terrified, diminutive little creatures alone, but emboldened by their comrades, they will turn into vicious killers. How do you play goblins in your campaign? What do you do to make them much more of a malice? Or do you use them as comedic relief? Let us know in the comments below so we can discuss and learn from one another and develop our goblins into being something just that much more interesting. Now, when we return with more creatures to look at, the um, next one that's on the list are kobolds. And I've specifically chosen to do these two diminutive races one after another because they are oftentimes looked at as being one in the same. And I think that they are so different, we might as well be comparing dragons to vampires. Anyway, until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming.